finally had a focus in our lives. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and we're back with another episode. Today, it's episode 310, and we're joined, I'm joined, by martial artist and musician, Mr. Donovan Blair. If you're new to the show, maybe you don't know my voice, I'd love for you to head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Check out the other 309, wow, it's a crazy number, episodes that we've done. On Mondays, we do a conversation, an interview episode with someone from the martial arts community. On Thursdays, we have more of a topic-driven show. Sometimes I'm joined by a guest or multiple guests as we focus on something singular. It might be a, a topic that's driving me crazy recently, or it could be something that one of you wrote in and said, what do you think about this? But through it all, twice a week, we bring you the best martial arts content that we can because we are traditional martial artists and we want to share that with all of you. Of course, the other thing that we share is all of the stuff that we make at whistlekick.com from protective equipment and training accessories to fun and functional apparel. It's all in the name of the traditional martial arts, the thing that brings us together all over the world. There are a lot of us, and martial artists are great people, aren't they? I think so. That's why I do this show. That's why I have the best job in the world. There are a lot of martial arts books out there, and some of them are really good. Some of them are really bad. And I hear from a lot of you as you read through these books. Well, it was from a listener writing in, talking about a book that today's guest comes. This listener found the book, and they said, you know, here's this guy who's a martial artist and a musician, and maybe you want to have him on the show. Well, fast forward, and we do have him on the show. And I have to be honest, this was one of my favorite episodes ever. I had such an amazing conversation with Mr. Blair. I was engaged. We would just, we had fun. And I think you can hear it in his voice too. Hopefully it comes through in mine. If it doesn't, I'm telling you point blank, I had a lot of fun. But that doesn't mean that we didn't get into some great stuff. Mr. Blair was open and authentic and talked about his life and challenges and the ways that music and martial arts connect for him. And I found it fascinating. So whether you are a martial artist or not, a musician or not, I expect that you're going to take something from this episode. So without any further ado, here it is. Hello, Mr. Blair. Hey, Jeremy, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am ordering barbecue, a typical Texas thing to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Did we did we get times crossed or or are you running late? No, sir. No, 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 okay. no, not at all. Okay. I was just my wife was like, "Hey, can you run by?" And grab. we're trying to not eat too much at night, sure. so we're just kind of. And if you do, I try to like stick to just protein, mm-hmm. you know. So I was just grabbing something on the way home. Is it? I just got out of my class. Like, oh crap. So no. I um, I was perfectly. That's had my. That's why I had my phone ready to go so we could talk and okay, stuff like perfect. that. Definitely. Yes, perfect. sir. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, I, I appreciate you doing this. This has been looking oh, forward no, to chatting you with too. you. Yeah. So you know, Me it, too. I, I've only been to Texas a couple times, but it seems like barbecue is almost a religion. In Texas. It is. Is that, is it that fair? So is that Mexican? Food? Oh, a hundred percent fair. And when I went vegetarian for years, mm. it killed me. I could not take it. It was just it was like I was going against being a Texan, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I, I can do it now. I know how to do it. And it's not hard, but it's it sure does hurt to do. <laughs> yeah. We love us. Where were you in Texas? Where did you visit? Uh, well, we used to have a warehouse in Rockport uh, until, you know, Harvey. Uh, and... Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And who yeah. do you work for? Uh, Whistlekick. You know, this is this is for our product oh, division. A... Oh, for your product division. Yeah. Okay, yeah. done. Yeah, okay. the, the gotcha. podcast is is a. I mean, to to be really blunt, you know, it's part of our marketing. 
You know, it's it's a nice. fun part of our marketing, but, but you know, uh, the way it started, we we kind of started looking around, saying, you know, maybe there's a podcast we can sponsor. And we had a couple conversations with people, and it just wasn't a fit. And I actually reached out to a good friend uh, named named Glenn, and Glenn was scheduled to host the podcast. We like we had conversations and meetings. We were ready to go, and then Glenn, the big jerk that he is, went and had a stroke, <laughs> oh. and he nearly died. <laughs> And I say that now, because, you know, I can say that because he's been on the show, uh, episode two, you know, he was, he, I brought yeah. him on right away and he's a good friend and, and, you know, um, he, he has no problem that I pick on him, but yeah. So I, I, am, oh. you know, picking up the mantle, so to speak. And it's, it's been life altering. Well, least. it's just a lot of fun to do. I hear so many people, they have so much fun doing it, you know, and you get to meet so many different people you get to, and it's kind of just like your viewpoint. You can do your show about whatever you want, yeah. you know, and you're not worried about, you know, it's just better than normal radio. It's normal. It's better than normal shows, which is why I think people get addicted to it. Like my younger brother, Zach is addicted to podcasts. He's just addicted to them, you know? And he's always saying, hey, you should listen to this podcast. Oh, podcast. You should listen to this. Like, God, Jack, I don't have time for this. I'm not a millionaire like you, okay? <laughs> there are so <laughs> many good ones. You know, we're at a point now where there is so much great media. Yeah, yeah, you know, we really are. And movies and music yeah. and, and, and just it's, it's so easily accessible that I almost feel guilty. People come to me and say, have you watched this show or this movie or this podcast? I'm like, I'm full. I, I don't. I don't have more. I, I, don't I know. Have more time. There aren't enough time in the there aren't enough hours in the day for me to to check out all the great stuff, you know. And it's I, I'm kind of in the mind of like if it's that amazing, I will I will find it eventually. Yep. You know, it's just kind of it, it. It tends to happen for me that way, you know. And but my brother has to take everything now. Listen to all of it right now, Bob. You know, so it's like. Jesus, Zach, I got a day job, you know? <laughs> well, the You don't. <laughs> the thing I find interesting about podcasts, and as a musician, you may find, you know, maybe you've thought about this too. Audio format, you can consume audio while you're doing other things. It's the only oh, format you can yeah. do that with. You yeah. can't watch movies or TV yeah. while you're driving, or you can't read a book unless it's become an audio book. Yeah, yeah, which is, I think, why uh, Audible has become so prevalent oh, with absolutely. people, you know? That's another one my brother's addicted to, and I and I love that. And we're actually TG, my co-writer and I are in the process of doing a uh, audio book oh, for, awesome. for, uh, for even if it kills me. We're pretty stoked. We've got some really cool ideas for it. Um, but I I love that. But I still just love reading a book and taking my time. Sure. You know, I mean, I am a I'm a Kindle nut. I love the Kindle app. I love my iPad and reading it on that. But I still love just going to the library and picking up a good book, you know. it's So it's kind of helped me in that regard. It saves on the, the wear and tear of my bookshelf. I'll tell you that much. The Kindle has. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, my God. It was bad. But... <laughs> But thank you for calling me about this. Of I course. appreciate it. Thank of course. you. So we, we have a decision to make at this point, and that is whether we consider the start of the episode, the start of the call with this great back and forth yeah. being something that we share with the listeners. And of course, they would hear this part awesome. as well. Are, are yeah. you good with that? Great. Cool. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. I mean, they, it's being from, there's so many stereotypes with being from Texas, you know, but <laughs> they're stereotypes because they're true. <laughs> Hockey people, we do say y'all a lot. We do love barbecue and Mexican food. I could eat Mexican food literally every day, you know. And, and you know, some of the stereotypes aren't true, but there's a lot of them that are, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, the Mexican food is something that I understand. And <laughs> while we do not have what I'm sure you would term good or maybe even authentic Mexican here in Vermont. I still eat it oh, three to four yeah, times a week yeah. because it's really You're good. You're in Vermont? I am. Oh, I've always wanted to go to Vermont because, for the silliest reason, 
I loved the Newhart show in the 80s, mm. the Bob Newhart show. Yeah. <laughs> it was set in Vermont, and then that theme song, I just loved it. Henry Mancini did it, and like the, I believe the scenery on it was Vermont, so I was always thinking, like, I want to go to Vermont, check that out, you know? So, well, we're going to brief us guys. We're yeah. going to have to circle back around to, to the listeners understand, you know, <laughs> a, a bit about you, but since we're on, the, sure. on this bit of a subject, there is an amazing venue in Burlington, Vermont, that if you guys ever okay. wanted to tack onto a tour, um, it's one of those that I, I think a lot of acts will schedule in because it's small. It, it's small-ish. I mean, for us, it's not small, but it's small. It's yeah. fun. And we went through this really bizarre stint where we were attracting a, a lot of relatively large acts in this fairly small space. And... You know, I heard some of the acts say, you know, we're here because it's fun. Uh, years ago, Wu-Tang did this mas- massive national tour. I'm a, a big hip-hop guy from the 90s. And they nice. did two dates in Burlington. It was the only nice. stop on the tour that they did two dates, you know, here in Vermont. And the show, wow. at least the day I was there, the show was packed. It's, you know, for I can, say, I can kind of speak from that perspective. Is you There are those certain towns that you know the venue isn't too huge and your money may not be fantastic because it's not a huge venue, but you don't care. And it reminds you of why you play. Like, oh, we know that the people of that town love music. We know it's going to be amazing. We know the venue's great. We know the staff is fantastic. Uh, We're going to get fed amazing. We're just going to have a great show. Who cares? Let's go play. Yeah. You know, there's, there's certain places around the country that you just fall in love with and you just look forward to going to play, mm. you know, it's and a lot of them on the East coast. I mean, like in Asheville, my God, I love playing Asheville. Um, there's so many small little towns, like just beautiful little Southern towns like that. And up in the Northeast as well, just like, Oh, I can't wait to get up there and play because you have just really great crowds and it's just a lot of fun, and it's like people, they don't take music performances for granted like they do in probably San Francisco or New York especially, mm, you know, right. or Boston or somewhere. So, I mean, and that's not to denigrate any of those cities. You know, I love playing all those cities, but I'm saying certain other towns might just have a better appreciation for when acts come to town. You know what I mean? Yeah, that might be why. It, it's, a, it's a culture thing, and you can say the same thing about martial arts schools or, or just, you know, oh, groups yeah. of martial artists or co- martial arts competitions. I mean, whenever you have a collection of people, you know, the culture that they're going to have can so dramatically affect the energy coming off of it. And I don't think there's a, there's a profession yeah. that understands better than musician. I mean, I'm certainly not a musician, but yeah. I've talked to enough of them. I have enough friends who are musicians that yeah. I think yeah. I get, I, I have some semblance of what it's like for you. It is. It's kind of um, taking that energy. That's what musicians can do. And I think going into these competitions that I've been, I've been doing a couple of jujitsu competitions. I haven't won any. <laughs> so let's make that clear. I haven't won a one yet. But it's, I'm going to learn and get better. One competition is almost equivalent to 10 classes, you know. And you learn so much about what you could have done, should have done, your heart rate. And it's the same as a gig. I remember my first gig, I think we did okay, my brother and I did. But we were just feeding off of the, the energy of the crowd, all 150 of them, <laughs> you know. But we didn't care. That's what we were there for. And we, we eventually learned how to take that energy and siphon it and use it, you know. We... Use our powers for good, not evil, you know. (laughs) You learn how to take that from other people and throw it back at them, good and bad. I've had lots of crappy crowds, and you take that bad energy and you feed off of it and you throw it back at them so they get the hint. Oh, okay. And it's a conversation between the crowd and you, you know. it's so, So many audiences think that, you're there for them. Like, nah, it didn't work that way. You're here for me. <laughs> I was going to do this anyway. You know, and some of that's a competition. Like, I was going to go and 
roll with someone and try to pull off a triangle choke on them anyway. You know, you're just here. You know what I mean? I do. So it's, it can, I think musicians in that regard have a little bit of an upper hand when it comes to competitions because we know how to take that energy and use it to our benefit, you know, quicker than most people do. A lot of people, it takes them, I've talked to a lot of my friends at uh, my school and it takes them a while to get used to that raw sense of energy that they have at these competitions, you know, and I'm usually calm at the few. I mean, I'll get the nerves, you know, but not so much as some people who I've seen just go off to the side and puke, you know, which is a natural reaction. They're so nervous. They want to do good. They want to do that. They don't want to get choked out, you know, and you know, the same thing as a show. You don't want to play a bad note or much like me, um, we were playing Lollapalooza. The Toadies were in 2008 and I was in front of 80,000 people who were going on right before Rachel. And my, it was during the bass part to away our song. Hold on one second. I had to kiss my wife. Hello. I apologize, Jeremy. Never apologize for <laughs> kissing your wife. Hello. Yeah, we've been together 25 years, oh, so we've, nice. we've got it. We know what we're doing. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, we were at Lollapalooza and it was, uh, this bass breakdown in a way where everybody sings along and stuff. And my gear went completely out, you know, in front of 80,000 people. I was freaking out. It was any performer's worst nightmare, you know, and I had a tech that just landed on my gear and started screaming at me. Keep playing for the love of God. Keep playing. <laughs> well, he corrected it, you know. So it was kind of just those kind of things. You don't want that to happen, but when that stuff happens, you have to know how to, you know, get past it. Sure. You know, so sure. go for it. Yes, now, yes. I, I am. I'm dying to start drawing correlations between martial arts and music, and I bet the listeners out there are nodding yeah. their head as I'm saying that. They want me to, to go there, and I want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> but we need to get a, just a little bit of context. We've talked, you know, okay. over the last f- nearly 15 minutes or so, a lot about music. And we've certainly alluded to your martial arts training, but we haven't gotten enough context that we can start drawing some solid lines between those two parts okay. of your life, which, from what I'm I'm gathering are two pretty big pillars in, in who you have become, who are you, who you're, you're looking to become as we move down the road. So can you roll back a little bit and tell us how yeah, you found definitely. martial arts? Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, like growing up in the eighties, um, my brother and I were just, we were hyperactive. We both had ADD, you know, and we were just literally all over the place. And we had gotten turned on to martial arts movies, you know, Um, Chuck Norris, ninja movies. I mean, we saw guys all dressed in black with swords, throwing stars. And we were just like, oh, my God, I want that. That's what I want to do. You know, I mean, if you see Chuck Norris, you know, just turn around and do a spin kick in someone's nose, that's what you want to do with your life, you know. So. We grew up in that era when those movies were so huge. I mean, like much like today, kids are growing up with uh, MMA in the USC, so that's what they want to do, you know? So it's kind of the same thing. It's just that that was our USC pretty much, you know? We loved wrestling as well. So we just loved anything kind of, uh, I don't want to say violent, but just something that took a lot of energy and exercise and you know, those kinds of things. So our, our parents decided to enroll us in a, they were calling it karate, but it was Taekwondo. And we ended up doing really well. We just kind of gravitated to it fairly, fairly quickly. And that's all we did. We did better in school after it because they would tell us, if you don't have good grades, you don't get to go to Taekwondo. I'm like, oh, crap. But we better do we better do good. We finally had a focus in our lives, you know, which was all we needed. And that's kind of what I think a lot of people don't think of kids that suffer from OCD. They just need a focus instead of 
80 million things, give them one thing to focus on, it will change their lives, you know, instead of, you know, all of these medications that you could give them, give them a purpose. That's kind of a cure all for OCD. It's, it's really helped my brother and I, you know, but that's a whole different point and subject. Um, I'm sorry, ADD. I was saying OCD. I meant ADD. I apologize. I have OCD too. So. <laughs> <laughs> what you meant Got was that. clear from the context. <laughs> yeah, I knew. But it. like, if you, if our my attention, you know, our attention would just go all over the place. And once we had Taekwondo, like, wow, we we didn't have this anymore. Like, you know, we were able to focus on things, and uh, it just kind of became our life like working on kicks with one another and blocks and strikes and things and, you know, going to class, bowing in and bowing out and learning our forms and working. And we advanced fairly quickly, you know, and almost got to blue belt, but times became a little bit hard, you know, to no fault of my mom and dad's own, just certain layoffs and stuff like that, that they couldn't help. And that had to go by the wayside, you know, and I think right after that, we turned into, we started playing guitars and bass and that took over from martial arts, you know, and then that was 30 years, <laughs> you know, fast forward to 30 years now, you know. So what happened after that 30 years? Oh, well, uh, just the whole time I had, I love to finish things. That's where the OCD comes in. <laughs> <laughs> I have to finish things. If I can if I start something, I have to complete it. So I had, uh, I would just see people go into class and in different schools and different towns, you know, and sometimes we'd be playing at venues and there would be martial arts schools next door. And I would see guys my age with white belts on and just kind of envious of them and like, wow, look at the, look at the guts look at the hairy ones on that guy. He didn't care. He's starting over, you know, he's going, he's doing this, you know, regardless if he gets hurt or not, he's going to see what happens. And I just always wanted to have enough time off to uh, do that because, you know, just always playing or always on tour or going to make a record with this band or that band, or, you know, never had, um, been able to push myself enough to do it. And finally, I just said, I'm done. I'm going to give this a shot. And I finally went back to a uh, Taekwondo school. I messed around with a couple of other styles, but nothing seemed to fit. And I knew I needed to um, go back to Taekwondo. I don't want to say finish because you never really finish in a martial art. You know, a black belt is not the, uh, the ending. That's just the beginning, you know, to me it is. But I at least wanted to get a black belt in Taekwondo before I could think of doing something else. And the band had decided to take uh, about a year off. And I kind of told myself like, well, this is it. It's now or never, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I'm only getting older. I'm still spry somewhat. (laughs) I have a little bit of life left in my limbs, so I need to give this a shot, you know, or kind of put up a shut up. Or are we able to curse on this briefly? I can say a phrase that my mom taught me. It's uh, if you feel strongly about it, get off the pot. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. it's what my mom would always she would tell people, you know, fish or get off the pot. But you know, and that's kind of basically how I felt about it, and I needed to do that and start over and I'm and I'm really really glad that I did you know because I don't I think it changed me in so many ways all of them positive there's not been one negative that's happened since I walked into that school you know even though I'm not there anymore it still made me a way better person better husband <clears throat> better person overall you know and it's just kind of continued on where I'm still trying to be good and shaping and I'm still taking a lot of lessons and using those that from a master cam that he taught. I use every day, you know? So here we go. Now we can start drawing, drawing some points in between these two pieces of your life. And the first thing I want to ask you, do you think that your success as a musician has anything to do with that stint in martial arts as a child? 
Um, yes, I do, because it taught us um, how to focus for once. You know, it, it taught us, you know, if you want to learn how to kick well, you got to practice. So we had to sit there in our room. My brother and I both shared a room, and we would just practice our kicks over and over and over again. Roundhouse, straight kick, you know, high kicks, double jump kicks. You know, we would practice our blocks over and over and over again. And that's the same thing with our forms. And our parents would push us. They're like, listen, you guys need to get out there and you need to practice. You know, you can't just, because I think, you know, first month or so we were in just, wow, this is great. And then we wouldn't practice. And my dad would look at us and go, hey, why aren't you two practicing? Like, that oh, will be fine. Was, no, you won't practice. You need to go practice. So that instilled it in us. And, and once we started doing that, we saw improvements in our performance. So it was just kind of a first, kind of an early major life lesson. You know, like, wow, if you practice at something, you will get better at it no matter what it is. And kind of uh, how I look at everything, no matter what the task is, the skill, whatever, anybody can do anything. If you practice it, it just takes drive, perseverance, and which is a tenet of Taekwondo, perseverance. Um, you just have to work at it hard. Doesn't mean it's going to come easy. You know, it might take forever. Sometimes it could be faster. Sometimes it might take a really long time, longer than you want, but you will get it. And that was the first time we learned it. So by the time we started attacking guitars and bass, we already had that instilled in us, that knowledge of, well, if we just work at this over and over and over again, our scales, our modes, you know, everything, we will get better. And then we did. And I, th I think if we had not done martial arts in the beginning, I don't think I would be able to have been a musician, you know, or to have been able to be, I don't want to say a great musician because I'm not, but I wouldn't have been able to be, uh, I advanced fairly quickly as a kid, I believe, because of Taekwondo, what I learned from it, you know. You may not put the label great on you, but you are a high-level musician and a professional, full-time musician. Is that is that accurate? Sure. Uh, but yes, I would say professional. Okay. Yes, full-time. I still, when I'm home, I still like to work. I, you know, just being at home all the time and not doing anything drives me nuts. So, and we've got fairly easy year. So, you know, one of those, but yes, I would say professional. So, I, so <laughs> to an extent. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of sidestep the, the issue of whether, you, whether you have to call yourself great or, or not, you know, we don't have to go there, yes. you know, so this gives yeah. us an idea of how, how, you know, we kind of got one direction on that line, how your martial arts impacted your music and let's, let's reverse it. Let's go the other direction. When you restarted your endeavors in martial arts, how did your experience as a musician impact your training? Um, well, I think it went full circle because those lessons I learned with martial arts and attributed to music, I had to put right back to it. It had been so long since I had done it, you know. I had to kind of, I was past the point of sitting down and working on scales and working on this you know, with music in regard to that, you know, I was beyond that. It would just be kind of learn the song, do it, and then go, you know, you, you, you get to that. I hate to say master, but that's kind of the only thing I can think of. I would, would think that's what, when someone masters anything, they don't really have to give it a lot of thought. Now I'm not Billy Sheehan. I'm not one of those guys that can tap on the bass or any of that, but as far as simple rock bass playing, what I've done, sure, I've mastered that, you know, and how I play, I've mastered that whole part of it, you know, but I look at master as a, I use it in a different context than in, to be some just pyrotechnical badass on the bass guitar, you know, John and Twistle, I'm not, so, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, you know, as far as facility goes and learning and using it, sure, so it was, taking those lessons and going right back to Taekwondo, I knew I had to go back and uh, really apply myself 
because it was not going to come to me easily at all. And it did not. It took a long time, long, long, long time to get even adequate at it. You know, I think it took about probably a year and a half before I even kind of felt comfortable with what I was doing. So, yeah, I just, I like the fact that, uh, it kind of came full circle for me. You know, I had, the lessons that I'd learned when I was a kid were coming right back to me and still helping me 30 years later. What was that first class back like? What was going through your head? Sweaty. <laughs> Sweaty. Sweaty. <laughs> and I was yeah. thinking like, wow, I'm really second guessing this move. <laughs> wow. I hope I made the right move here. Uh, just because it was just so hard. I mean, I had been in shape, you know, but nothing like that at all. But I, I apparently, and I write about this in the book, um, I was in better shape than I thought, you know. Uh, I was actually handling my own with everyone with the conditioning and things because I had been working out a lot and trying to run and jog and things. And, you know, I wasn't, I hadn't, you know, you know, de- you know delayed or de- gone into a slothfulness or anything like that. But I was... I wasn't where I wanted to be. And so once I got there, it was very hard the first half hour. And then after that, I kind of thought, well, not dead yet. Let's see what happens here. (laughs) And at the end of the class, I got in my car. I'm like, didn't die. Okay, I'll go back, you know. So it was just uh, the point of I had conquered that first class. Past that, it was just putting one foot in front of the other. You know, I think after that initial class and just meeting people and being an older guy, I was the oldest guy there, uh, getting over that shyness because I'm pretty just going into a room with people. I'm pretty shy. You know, I can, I love nothing more than be a recluse. That's why I play bass. That's why John and is my hero because he didn't move. He didn't do anything. He let Moon and Townsend do all that, you know? <laughs> I've always had my brother, Zach, as my foil. Like, you want to see pyrotechnics? Let him do it. I'm going to stay over here and do my own thing. (laughs) He's more than happy to do that, you know. But so it was just getting over that initial shyness. And I think definitely doing that helped me break out of my uh, shell a little bit, you know. It's hard, though. (laughs) And then I went home and took a really, really long, hot, Epsom salt bath, which I've kept doing every night, and I'm probably going to do in about an hour. <laughs> Those are good. Those are helpful. Oh, I have to. Yeah, I just left class right before you called, so it's uh, yeah, I'm gonna need to. I call it an old man bath, you know. One of the things that I love talking to martial artists about is the ways that they use that skill set, and you talked about how those lessons from your instructor still you know, permeate every day for you. Yes. Yeah. And you talked about, yeah. you know, being on stage at Lollapalooza and your, your gear going down, but you know, here you have the, the frame of mind to, to keep going. I mean, granted you, you said the tech was yelling at you to keep playing, but, and, and I'm sure <laughs> yeah. your experience as a musician was a large part, likely the, the largest part of that, of, of why you were able to keep going. But I'm going to guess that you have some other stories that you could reflect on. Maybe share one with us where it was your martial arts skill set that allowed you to keep going or go around or overcome or whatever it was. Just something hard that you're willing to talk about. Well, yeah, it's been – well, um, being on tour a lot, there is – you meet up with a lot of drunkards and people who are, you know – more than slightly inebriated, unfortunately. And um, sometimes they would try to push their way backstage. They want to meet the band. They want to do this. They want to do that. Or you're just outside in these, uh, or, you know, bigger, you know, like they're like South Street in Philly, you know, or uh, in New Orleans. Any kind of place that after hours it's just bumping, you know, it's hopping. There's people everywhere. There's drunk people. You know, and um, a lot of times, you know, a a few times on tour, I've run into people and guys who have been 
a little bit too aggressive, you know, with trying to get backstage or with my band or with me or what they say. And old me, before I went back into martial arts, used to just become 36 crazy fists. You know, I just, something would snap in my head. I would hear like a bing, and then I would just start throwing fists. Now, I'm not saying I won these fights. I'm just saying I start throwing fists, you know. And now I have found that after, you know, taking my black belt and doing martial arts at this point, I don't go down that road anymore. Even with the arguments with people, I just don't do it. I can control my temper and my anger and go, really, is this something that I want to go into violence? No, I'm going to sit here and talk to this person. Or I'm just going to walk away. You know, I'm not going to engage them. I will not do that, you know. And arguments with anyone, um, it doesn't matter, you know. I have, I think I have a better ability to, and I I would say most martial artists have that, you know. Um, A good ability to just talk people down or just have the ability to walk away. Because you know in your brain you can finish this. You can do this. And you might be able to harm that person and it's not their fault. You know, it's yours. They, yeah, they're inebriated, but you know, they're under the influence of something, you know, they're, they're not of their right mind. You are. And you also, not only are you of your right mind, but you also have this skill set where you could hurt them. So how does that prove that you're an awesome person? That's not what martial arts teaches us. It teaches us restraint, you know, and that's been a big help being on tour. <laughs> I've had to use that whole uh, calming myself down a lot with people, unfortunately. But I've never, I haven't yet had to uh, resort to violence with anyone. You know, it's either just talk people down or walk away, you know. That's good. And, you know, I think quite often we talk about winning fights, you know, self defense yeah. as martial artists. And yeah. as far as I'm concerned, the, the superior thing to that even is not getting into the fight in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the, that's the best part. You win, you know, they might think in their head, ah, you know, you walked away. Ha ha. I win. Both Uh, both people can win. It's the only way that both people can win. Exactly. You have, they have no idea on these things. So it's like, well, it's, and I don't, I'm not a drinker. My, I'm straight edge. I, I, I have a, really, really low tolerance for people that are drunk and getting in my face and just being obtuse and things like that. I can't take it, you know, so it's, but I feel for those people because they, you know, they're not of their own mind. They're not in control of their actions. Yeah, they were when they put the bottle to their mouth that many times and when they knew they were going to get really screwed up, but it's like, well, okay, how am I a big man, you know, beating up on this person that's their reaction time is slowed down. They don't know what's going on. Ooh, big man, me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're right. It's, I, and I, you know, I, I don't, I don't respect people that do have that ability and use it all the time. Like, wow. Okay. You beat up on people. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> you hear a black belt in this or a, a purple belt or a brown belt. Of course you beat them up, you know? So it, 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 there's just nothing to prove in that in that regard, I don't think. Is it fair to say, I, maybe I'm reading between the lines something that's not there, but did you have a temper? Would you say you were an angry oh. person? No, I think, I don't think an angry person. I think just as a kid, I was picked on a lot. So you tend to... I don't know. It's just kind of a defensive mechanism, you know, in high school and just school. I was just a scrawny little kid. So I got picked on a lot. Never would start fights. I would just finish them, though, you know. And I I write about this in the book as well. Um, You know, if I if someone hit me or tried something with me, I would always fight back. And then I would more often than not, you know, get beaten up by someone bigger than me and go home. And I would be kind of shameful, just kind of bombed and embarrassed that I lost a fight. And I would talk to my old man and he would go, 
Well, was the guy faster than you? I'm like, yeah. Is he bigger? Yeah. Did you take any of his fish? No, sir. Good boy. That's all he wanted. <laughs> Don't take people's shit. That's what our parents taught us, you know. So I think it it kind of turned into that, just not taking any fish, you know. But before I learned martial arts, again, you know, I kind of figured out, you know what? It's okay if you take this first fish. <laughs> it's it's not going to kill you. You have the you have the ability to really harm this person. Who cares if you take it? You know, it's just getting older, getting more mature, and figuring out that that leads to nothing. You know, violence leads to nothing. You know, who cares if this person pushed you? Who cares if they did this or they did that? Just kind of a life lessons. You know, mm. and hard learned with bruised knuckles and stuff like that, you know, and bloody noses, but nothing I'm proud of. And it, again, it's not like I was a bruiser. I never walked away from a fight, but after it, I would kind of just feel kind of like, ugh, I don't like that I engaged in violence with that person. You know, even if you win the fight, that person wins. If you were able to start striking them, they still won the fight because they manipulated you into hitting them, you know, because of what words, come on, you know, we all have to be better than that. I think, especially these days in this day and age, you know, too many people let words get the best of them and they get into all kinds of arguments and things. And it's just words, you know? So do you, I'll get off my high horse on that. No, no, <laughs> it, I, I don't think you're on, on a high horse at all. I think, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that you're talking about, a, a bit of your journey, a realization that you had a third option, you know, yeah. kind of early yeah. on, it was exactly. fight or, you know, be the lesser person yeah. that the person picking on you was trying to get you to feel exactly. like. And so there's exactly. a way to disengage that most of us as martial artists, many of us, even as non-martial artists start to understand as we get older and certainly not everyone learns that yeah. when did you realize you had that third choice that you could step away and not feel less than um i think it was at a few uh one of our tests for one of our belts i can't remember which one uh it was later on uh, it was then i went on tour it was the ability like you know in in taekwondo we break boards you know, and these boards that we were breaking were inch thick. They were not thin boards <laughs> at all. And one of my tests, I had to break one with a roundhouse kick. I had to break one with a side kick, uh, you know, a jump kick and a tornado kick. And in a weird way, doing that with my feet, it was like, my God, I can harm someone with these, you know. That's kind of a realization. It's different than with your fists, you know. Um, I'm not a very strong man. I don't have big muscles or anything like that. So I don't really have a lot of faith in the damage that my fists <laughs> could do to someone. But uh, the feet, though, if, you know, you hit someone correctly, you can break their jaw. You can snap their neck. There's so many things you could do. You can... You know, uh, yeah, you just break their chest. You can break ribs. That's kind of a uh, that's a responsibility on your shoulders, you know. And it's like, oh yeah, you go home from a test. Like, yeah, I broke all these boards. Like, but wait, what if those were bones? What if that was a human being? It's kind of a weight that people need to take on and and think about seriously, you know. And I think right after that, after one of those tests, I'd gone on tour and. You know, someone was in my face trying to yell and trying to get me in an altercation. And this test was fresh in my mind. And I was just thinking about it, going, wow, I could seriously do some damage to this person. And that is just not worth it. And then I walked away. And that was a big step for me. You know, whereas normally I would usually get hot, super hot under the collar. And, you know, and I felt that. But unlike the other times, I would just start whatever. I just didn't do anything. 
calm down. And in my head, I was, you know, letting him yell. And I was thinking in my head, like, well, if he does this, I will do this and react accordingly. And I can take him down to the ground and end this very quickly and swiftly, and it won't be that much harm to him. That's what I'll do. So I think it was just able to teach me that uh, kind of calm in the middle of a storm, you know, that's what I think the best thing martial arts do. A lot of us can't help if we get angry quickly. You know, it's just what we do with it. We can either uh, engage with it. We can let it um, shape us and move us, or we can tell it to calm down. We can take control of the situation. That's what martial arts is best for is being able to take control of the situation, but you have to take control of you first, then you take control of the situation, you know? Well, that was a long answer. I apologize. Never, (laughs) never apologize for the long answers or the tangents. They are a hallmark of the show. Good. Okay. Um, I have have a saying that doesn't show up too often on the show. It's usually, you know, before or after it's, the best stuff is on the edges. Yeah. And that's why yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hands off in my interview style. I just, I just let the guests go and they, they talk themselves into <laughs> wonderful, wonderful content. And I just sit here and, and sometimes I have to remind myself, Hey, you're not just listening to this. You have to participate too. Uh, especially when we have someone who's just blowing my mind or telling a, yeah. a, a an amazing story or a sad story or something. And it's like, you know, here I am. The tears are, rolling down my face and I have to pretend that I'm not a blubbering mess. Uh, there are some episodes where it certainly comes through. I didn't do a great job of hiding it, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> Tell us about what your training looks like now. Oh, well, um, after I had done Taekwondo, I'd gotten my black belt and I had, um, I was searching I had actually got kind of, there was a review of my book recently in a Taekwondo magazine. And the reviewer, he didn't like the fact that early in the book, I talk about black belts that leave once they get black belt. And I thought that was kind of BS. How would you ever want to do that? And then I ended up doing the same thing. And he kind of called me on it. And I liked that. I liked that he called me on and I knew that was going to happen. Um, because I thought I, I, we left it in the book to show progression, you know, because you just you grow through martial arts no matter what, you know. And I like Taekwondo, like it's just so physical, especially with the hips. My hips were killing me constantly. Um, my body was breaking down. You I know, mean, my knees were killing me. My joints were killing me from all of the spinning kicks and stuff like that. And I wanted to continue martial arts. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And I have a really, really, really close friend, uh, really like one of my closest friends, a guy named Chad Smith that runs a tattoo shop here called American Vengeance. And my wife and I would go to him for tattoos and we would talk and he would go, man, you need to come to a jujitsu class. Like you do jujitsu? He goes, yeah. He had just gotten his black belt uh, from Guto Campos, who started uh, Atos. Any jujitsu nerds like myself out there will probably know what I'm talking about. And Chad was Guto's first American black belt. So he kept talking to me about this, and he was like almost a religious zealot, you know, right? Almost didn't want to go to my appointments because I knew he was going to hound me about jujitsu and not shut up about it. Like, oh, God, you know. And finally, I I was like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. What the hell? You know, why not? So I went to one class, and I've been ever since. And it's been the most difficult thing I have ever done in my life, hands down. No ifs, ands, or buts. Why? It is it, it just the physicality of it, for one. All It's way more physical than the training I did with Taekwondo, but my body isn't broken down as much. You know, it's made it stronger. I'm more flexible. I'm uh, more resilient in the best shape I've ever been in in my life. You know, just the conditioning aspect of it is insane. And whenever you're rolling with someone or sparring, 
you're lifting another human, you know, or, you know, you're figuring out your body in weird ways. It's that it's, it also retrains your mind. And so if you're coming from a, uh, a kicking martial art like myself, it's a mind blow. It's taken a long time for me to just get a basic slim grasp of it, (laughs) of the basics of it. I'm still grasping, you know, there are people that started with me. Actually, there's a good friend of mine in Colby uh, that started, I think, pretty much the same day as me. He got his blue belt the other day because he got gold at a world in a Long Beach. And I'm just, I could not be prouder and happier of him. You know, it's just really cool to see your training partners do that. You know, it's a big accomplishment. And he got his blue belt in a year and a half. So it's just, insane and to see that and so basically i'm sorry to go back to your question it's uh just my training is i will uh probably do two miles jog a few miles uh, a few times a week i try to keep up with my upper body strengths and just do a lot of um uh body weight i don't want to add any weight onto me you know not too much i just do mainly push-ups and uh, tricep dips things like that. If I do anything with weights, it's, uh, with uh, kettlebells, you know, um, and the majority of it is just doing class. Class is just kind of the best training I can do. It's, uh, I'll do that four times a week and our school, we really believe in conditioning, really believe in conditioning. (laughs) Sometimes when I don't want to believe in the conditioning, we still have to do the damn conditioning, you know, and it's pretty straight, pretty hardcore, about 10, 15 minutes at the top of class constantly. Then we uh, will learn techniques and drill, and then we roll, you know, and that's pretty hardcore, which is why I'm really sore right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, it's addictive to it, especially if you pull off something cool. Um, I've had a couple of weeks of just down weeks, not really doing anything. And just questioning why I started jujitsu in the first place. And then last night I pulled off a really cool move. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> and the, the other thing about it that I love the most is the openness of it with everyone. Um, it's just, it's like, I'm sure everyone else that does jujitsu who listens to this knows it's, it's like a brotherhood, a family, you know? Um, there's this person right on top of you trying to strangle the crap out of you and take your head off. And if they do it, you get up and congratulate them. Like, that was amazing. How did you almost break my arm again? Show me, you know, (laughs) it's just, uh, that's kind of one of the things that I've stayed is just, uh, the family atmosphere. Everybody is just so supportive of one another it's nothing like, oh, you couldn't do that. Maybe next time, you know, you know, or a completely denigrating thing. There, those kinds of people don't last in jujitsu. They definitely don't last in our school. You know, it's you're either supportive of everyone or get out. You know, and it doesn't matter how bad you are, how good you are. To everyone, there kind of on the same level because you show up and train. That's the thing. They don't care while you're training if you get tapped out 50 times or if you end up tapping people 50 times. It matters that you just show up and train. That's it. Past that, well, just see what happens. You know, it's kind of like the equalizer, walking into the door and walking on the mat. That's all anyone asks. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of been uh, one of the coolest things ever to happen to me, you know. So I owe Chad a lot for that. Nice. Now you're calling it jujitsu, but I'm I'm hearing Brazilian jujitsu. Is that? Yeah, okay. I'm just I'm saying jujitsu. Uh, just be instead of Brazilian jujitsu. Our uh, professor is actually Guto's brother, uh, Guilherme Campos. His nickname's Seco, and um, he's he and um, uh, Guto and uh, Andre uh, Valvao. They uh, or Andre and I think Guto started Atos. And uh, Seco was right there with them. And so we're kind of learning this stuff from the tab, you know. 
cool. straight from the Brazilians. That's really awesome. And they are hardcore. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. God, let me tell you. <laughs> but I love it. There's no uh, watering down at all. You know, they don't allow any of the other instructors to water down. Either. You know, we've got a we got a pretty really good school is just in this small little panhandle town of Amarillo. You know, so we're pretty, we're pretty happy with it. You know, I forget where I heard this, you know, I would give credit if I could, but my memory is failing me. You know, when we talk about martial arts, traditional martial arts, we tend to talk about striking arts, stand up arts. The majority of people are involved in something like karate or Taekwondo. And that's something that you can practice on your own. You talked yes. about that at, at the top of the show. But when you talk about grappling arts, it's yeah. pretty darn hard to practice yes. on your own. You need another person and you need that flow back and forth. You talked about yep. the, you didn't use this word, but I heard it in your voice, the joy of pulling off something for the first time, <laughs> rolling with another person. And I'm wondering if for you, you're seeing the tie with music that I am because I'm never, yeah, I'm no. probably not going to a show to watch one person play. You, you know what? I, I love where you're going with it. And that was a struggle for me doing this. Cause you're right with, with Taekwondo. If I didn't go to a class, if I was just tired, like, okay, I really don't feel like going to a class tonight, but I, what I will do, we'll go in the garage and I will do this many kicks. I will work on my form this many times. I don't feel like leaving the house. I'm exhausted, but I do need to work out. And that's my OCD talking, you know, so I could, you know, I could go through all of my blocks, all of my kicks and my form in about 30, 45 minutes. And I felt pretty good with myself. Like, okay, didn't go to class, still worked out. I still worked on my technique and things with this. I have to go to class. If not, there are things you can do and you can buy a good dummy. I bought a dummy that I can do certain drills with. Um, I have a shed in the back of my house that I matted out, not with great mats, but some mats. And on Sundays, a couple of the guys from my class will come over and we'll just do drilling, you know, for about an hour, hour and a half. We'll work on things. Um, but in that shed, I will work on basic things just like bridge bridges, shrimps, um, certain drills that I can do solo, but it, it's taken a, it's taken a while to get to that point where I can work on this by myself and feel okay. I think that's why people want you to just go train. That's where you learn, you know, um, at my first class, we, uh, we did all of it. We did the conditioning. And again, I thought I was going to die. And we did some, uh, we learned some technique, then we did some drilling. Now, a lot of classes, a lot of like first time classes in schools, they, you wait for about probably three or four months before you start rolling. They want to make sure that you have the techniques down correctly, which is not a bad practice at all. You know, I think it's just everybody does it different. But at my school, I noticed, like, all right, let's roll. So I was like, oh, thank God, I'm just going to watch. So I'm stepping off the mat and Chad, the guy that got me there, puts his hand on my back and he goes, where the hell are you going? I said, well, you guys are rolling. Oh, I'm just going to watch. He goes, the hell on the mat? Like, oh, for the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> said, I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, neither did we. Get on the mat. I'm like, oh, my God. And I just got murdered over and over and over and over again, you know. And that's kind of where you learn, though. You get your hours in on the mat. You know, you can drill. You know, there's the saying that drillers make killers, and that's correct. But if you don't utilize it correctly in rolling, you're never going to get it, you know. So I still, I'm still having a lot of problems with things. I can drill my, my ass off, and I can get the technique great. Then when it comes to actual real-time application and rolling, just goes out the window. Like, oh, I forgot what I was supposed to do here. You know, so it's, you know, with that time on the mat, hours and hours and hours of it, it's the same as practicing scales, the same as practicing kicks. It's the same as everything. It's just a different way of doing it. 
I can't go off and work on a triangle choke on the dummy that much. You know, it's kind of hard, you know. I have to do it in real time with someone that's fighting back and isn't going to let me do it. (laughs) That's the point. You have to figure out your timing. You have to figure out your body where it's supposed to be. And it's, it's really hard. It is like, uh, you know, just putting the right puzzle pieces together at the right exact time. I kind of, I liken it to jazz, you know, it's, um, a lot of other martial arts are pretty much straight. You know, you're going to get a kick, you know, you're going to get a punch or a block with this. You have no idea what you're going to do. You know, it's kind of according to your body shape, how you like to do things. Are you explosive? Are you more of a, you know, person that likes to just stand there and put pressure on people. There's a guy that I roll with a friend of mine named Tyson. who's probably five, three, five, four blue belt. And I think I outweigh him by about 25, maybe even 30 pounds. And I cannot beat this guy for the life of me. (laughs) No matter what I do, he's got me. His technique is insane. And his pressure is perfect, you know. And it's the game he plays. He's not fast. He takes his time. And God help you when he's ready to put it on you, you know. It's that's the thing about it. And you'd look at his body style and you wouldn't go, wow, he might be fairly fast. Nope. (laughs) You would be mistaken. He puts all of his pressure on you and he knows how to double it up at the wrong spots on your body, you know? Um, And that's just kind of like how it is. It's when you're rolling, you're kind of like jamming with someone, you know, you, you don't know what you're going to come up with. You're just going to start and you'll end up somewhere at the end of it. You know, that's what I think I like the most about uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is it's, it's the closest thing to music that a martial art could be. You know, it's, you pick your style and you go for it. And then that person will react accordingly with their style. You know, they might be playing heavy metal and you're playing jazz. You see what the hell happens in between, you know, it's either, cacophony or not you know (laughs) you know what i'm saying it's but that's yeah it's pretty neat it's pretty cool thing awesome now we've talked about your book a few times already today and this might be a good time for the listeners to know more about the book that you wrote and i think most importantly why you wrote it um well i kind of i just i'm a huge huge book nerd huge book nerd I've always got my face in one or I'm reading three at any time. You know, if I'm reading one book, that's not enough. I got to have others as backups in case that one's boring, you know? Um, And I've always just wanted to try my hand at it. Kind of the same as with Taekwondo or jujitsu. I at least want to try things. If I fail, if I fail at it, okay. The, The only real way I fail is if I don't try. You know what I mean? Mm. So with the book, I was just trying to think if I could pull it off. And my wife kept telling me, you should really write. I think you'd be really good at it and it would do well. And I just, I tried it to prove her wrong. But again, she was right. So somebody did want to put it out and it turned out okay. (laughs) (laughs) So she was right again. Um And I just kind of um, I mean, started with an article with a Taekwondo magazine. They had said, uh, hey, if you have an idea for a column, send it to us, you know, let us see what we think, you know, and we'll, if we like it, we'll publish it. So I had an idea for a travel log because being a touring musician and working out, I didn't have the options that everybody else does. They can go to their they can go to their dojo that they go to all the time. They can go to the academy. They can do whatever. The people who are traveling, musicians, businessmen even, you know, the traveling salesmen, what the hell can we do, you know? Go to different ones, of course, but it's kind of weird and it's kind of hard. So it was just kind of about that, kind of like a travel log of seeing different towns and trying to figure out cool places to work out in a hotel room or in a parking garage or kind of wherever you are and finding a place to work out. 
and they liked the idea. And they ran about four of those, and then they stopped it. I don't know why, but <laughs> then they were like, "Ah, we're not going to run these anymore," which is fine. And I kind of just got a wild hair up my butt and was like, you know, I wonder if I could try and turn this into a book of some sort. So I started looking up uh, how you do, uh, I guess it would be called a, like kind of like basically a demo tape for publishers, you know, what that would be. And you had to write a certain amount of pages, tell them the market would be, you know, who you would go to and things like that. So I kind of, I did my homework on it. I did about 35 pages and I sent it to uh, a few publishers and uh, YMAA got back to me immediately. And David Ripianzi liked the idea and he put me to TG and we went from there. They really liked it and they have been 100% supportive. Still kind of a dream come true. It sounds kind of corny, but it is, you know, to be a lifelong book nerd, to actually hold a book in my hand that I wrote, you know or for other people <clears throat> to buy it that I don't know and actually get something out of it is one of the coolest things I've ever done. You know, it fills me with so much happiness and joy, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's actually hard to explain, you know, which isn't a good thing for a writer. But. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things that defy words. I mean, when you get right down to That's it, kind of, emotions yeah. are pretty hard to express with words. So I'm not going to yeah, fault you for it that. Is. It's I, I, that's how much I love books and love reading. I mean, actually, I would if I could make a good living as a librarian, I would give everything up to be a librarian and be surrounded with books all day long. I I promise you this. <laughs> how much I love books. So to actually have written one and added to that is just it. Yeah, I can't express that in words, you know. And they even have people read it and like it and email me and contact me and say how much they liked it. Or a lot of people have said, Hey, I don't know who the hell your band is. And, um, I don't care. Or a couple of people have said, I didn't know who your band was and I heard it. I didn't like it, but I really liked the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, all right, well, that's, that's cool. And some people aren't even martial arts fans they're music fans of the band and they ended up liking it and getting something from it. So just the fact that people have read it and enjoyed it and gotten something from it has just been a huge joy to me. You know, it just makes me feel really good. That's awesome. And of course, in a moment, we'll talk about where folks can get the book, but um, you know, we're, we're starting to wind down here. I'm noticing the time, but I, I okay. want to try and, and construct this almost triangle between the book okay. and music and martial arts. I can see where there, you know, one, you know, where your martial arts might have helped you with the book, maybe, you know, persistence. I can see where maybe the creativity of music helped you with the book. But I want you to put it in your words. I mean, were there things as you were writing this book that you said, you know, obviously the subject matter has to do with both of these other passions in your life. But were there, again, tools you pulled out of your toolbox? where you said, you know, ah, you know, this part of the book is happening better or I'm doing something that I'm really proud of because of my training in music or martial arts. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's all, um, I think it just goes back to that lesson I learned as a kid that came from Taekwondo is just persistence and practice, you know. It's, practice literally does make perfect, you know. I but I applied that with music and I applied that with writing. You know, I had to. I would take times where I would just um I didn't beat myself over the head with things. If I if it wasn't coming to me, I had enough uh I guess in my life being a musician, you go to inspiration for other if you need to be creative, listening to other kinds of music to get inspired to write or something like that. So I would just kind of take a break and learn and uh, start reading other authors that I just love, like David Sedaris or, or Henry Miller or Ernest Hemingway or, th or people like that, you know, or even Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain taught me a huge lesson reading because his, his books are like word porn, to be quite honest, and gave me a good 
they gave me a good idea of what I wanted my book to be in that I don't care what he's talking about. I could care less about duck country or his mise en place or how the hell this gets done or whatever. I loved how he described it, you know, how his passion came through the words he used, you know, I think with, really good writing. It doesn't matter the subject matter. I mean, someone like David Sedaris, he writes about, again, about the mundane, you know, his life, if you look at it, is interesting to a point. It's kind of boring though, the things that he goes into and talks about, but it's the way he does it, you know, that keep you rooted. I wanted to just reread that. So I really struggled with that and I would have to sit back and look at it because I knew I wasn't going to create another for whom the bell tolls or anything, you know. Anyway, I'm not. You know, everybody's okay on that end. But I wanted it to be interesting, something I would reread over. It's the only reason I'll make records. Am I going to listen to it another five years and get a smile? Yes. Cool. Then it's worth it, you know. The same with this. So is it going to give me the same kind of zing and make me crack up as when I read these other authors? Cool. If it did that, then I went with it, you know. If not, and it seemed too written, you know, then I would just end up trashing it. And TG, my co-writer, felt the exact same way with me. I got lucky being able to work with that guy, you know, because he had exactly the same ideas as I did. He would be able to push me when I was just completely tired. I had come home from... You know, there would be days where I would work, then go to class to train, and then I would have to be up another two or three hours writing, you know. Sometimes I just didn't want to do it. I was exhausted, and he would be like, listen, you can't not do this. you got to get after it, <laughs> you know. And no matter if I did if I did it and it wasn't great, I'd have to redo it again until it was, you know. We set a, a mark for ourselves and a good standard, and I think – we hit it on all the chapters, you know. We knew what we wanted ahead of time. Like once it started shaping up, we were able to see it. Oh, wow, this is what it's going to be. But it was all things that I learned from from martial arts and, you know, that, that I took to uh, music, you know. But I think everything began with doing Taekwondo, you know. Kind of circuitous route there, but <laughs> sorry about that. Jim. No, again. Please don't apologize. That was that was great stuff. <laughs> and so tell the listeners, where can they find this book? Um, as far as bookstores go, if you're like me and you just love to go to bookstores, uh, Barnes & Noble. Uh, also, Books A Million. I don't know if you guys have those up in the Northeast we don't. at all. We don't, but okay. you know, we're, 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 more than, we're more than a regional podcast, so I'm sure somebody listening somewhere sure. says, I know yeah. where that bookstore is. I know where that is. Yeah, that's kind of the major uh, major bookstores. Uh, there's also independents and things like that. Um, and obviously Amazon, you know, you can get it from there or uh, Kindle, you know, um, because I'm such a Kindle nerd. I went ahead and bought my own book for Kindle just to have it for prosperity, you know, <laughs> just like, nice, this is awesome. Um and I believe, like I said, we're going to be releasing an audible version of it within a year. I hope so. Hopefully early next year we'll be releasing an audible version. And we're going to add really cool things. It's not just going to be some guy reading the chapters. You know, it's kind of the bored, disinterested voice. It's either going to be TG or myself, or we might, I think we're going to enlist other people for other voices. I think my brother might play the voice of my dad in it, <laughs> stuff like that. So we're going to, we're going to have a lot of fun with it and make it a cool listening experience, not just a book on tape type thing. Well, you know, I look forward to being able to check it out. Ah, definitely. I will send as soon as we get it, I will send you a link to it. Oh, please. By all means. Yes, sir. Cool. Done. All right. And now if people want to get a hold of you over social media or, you know, other websites, I'm assuming the band has a website that you might want to share. You know, this is kind of kind yeah. of your time to plug those things. And, of course, we'll drop them in sure. the show notes. Anybody that might be new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where we put all that stuff. Okay. And they can go to thetoadies.com or they can check us out with Instagram and uh, Facebook. 
myself also, please get a hold of me on Facebook. And if people want to message me or send me anything, please send me a message. I don't respond too quickly to face to the friend requests, uh, but messages I do. Uh, that's how I've you know, had the pleasure of talking to a lot of people. Uh, they will uh, just message me, and then we'll just have correspondence from there. You know, so that's kind of the quickest way to get a hold of me to say you like the book, or you've used it as toilet paper. Either one is okay. You know. <laughs> well, that would be They're really honest. expensive <laughs> and horribly uncomfortable toilet paper. I think someone would really have to hate the book to do that to themselves. Hey, I know, but hey, at least they're being honest. Like, man, I use this thing as toilet paper. Like, well, it's your dollar, buddy. You can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty also, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. You know, cool. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah, you gotta, you can't. Go ahead. Yes, sir. No, no, please finish. Cause we're, we're wind, we're winding down. I don't want to cut you off. Oh no. I was just saying, I prefer people being honest. I mean, I, I had quite a few people that said they didn't, they didn't really care for it and that's fine. Um, I, I like people being honest with me. If I ask them, if I just, are you there, Jeremy? Oh, I'm here. I'm absolutely here. Okay. I, I heard a click. Sorry. If, uh, you know, if I, I've asked a few people, what did you think? Like, uh, this part and that part, and there was this, you know, like, cool. But I have had a few people that just roll up on me and go, you know what I didn't like about your book? Like, no, <laughs> I didn't ask. So keep it to yourself. <laughs> if I ask, unload on me. Get it to me. You know, both barrels. I don't care. But if I don't ask, well, you know. But I, I do welcome anyone to get contact me if they want to hold up correspondence and tell me what they think, you know? Awesome. You know, one of the things that I have to remind myself as Whistlekick grows, as we're taking on more projects, releasing more products and having guests, sometimes controversial guests on the show is that if we're making everyone happy, we're probably not pushing the boundaries. When you think of the exactly. music that yeah. plays in public places where people are trapped, you know, elevators or coffee shops, it generally mm -hmm. tends to be pretty mild, pretty watered down. Yep. And yep. you don't see a lot of people that say, you know what I love about elevators? The music. I, I agree with you. I, I like uh, discourse. I like discussion and opinions. You know, that's only how you can better yourself. And I think that's all people need to figure out is – there's just differences of opinion and you can have discussions. You can have discourse with people intelligently, you know, I mean, in the area I live, it's, it's different from them where I was raised in Texas. It's a different part of Texas than what I was raised in and my household. And I've been able to have some really good discussions with people that have opposing views than me. You know, I've learned that in this town, you know, how to listen to other people and have, great conversation and great discussions and listening to people. And I, I, I think you're right. If you're, if you're, if people aren't going to have a really good opinion on it, then it's probably vanilla, you know, um, anything I do, I would hate for people, anyone to go, it was okay. Oh, no, I liked it. Well, I would rather someone go, I hated it. And this is why I'm like, cool. I provoked a reaction from you, you know, an honest reaction. That is what good uh, art should be. Art, music, writing, it should provoke a reaction, not a, eh, that's okay. <laughs> you know? I that, could not agree that does anymore. Nothing, you know, that does nothing. And I mean, as a musician and, and a writer, I want people to have a good gut instinct about, what they read if I write it. And if they hate it, awesome. Tell me you hate it. Why did you hate it? What did it instill in you that you hated it that much? Cause I've read things that I hate it and I just don't want to ever read it again or ever see it again or anything I'm like, wow, but that's pretty good. It got that much of a reaction out of me, and you know? And it doesn't mean that's that you're not better for it. Exactly. I've learned from it, you know, and it doesn't mean that it's, and it's some stuff that, other people just love I'm like, okay, well, 
that's a difference of opinion. That's fantastic. But, you know, does that make this bad that I hated it? No, it makes it, even though I hated it, it made it great that it instilled that kind of a reaction in me. You know, it's better than anything that's like, oh, I read that. That was pretty good. That sold, you know, 16 million copies or whatever. You know, I think if you get that much of uh, just a gut instinct from something and you hate it or you just love it, that's great art, no matter what it is. It doesn't matter, you know. For sure. You've been so open today. You've been so great at sharing so much. And, and I'm almost guilty to ask you for just the tiniest bit more. But I always ask the guests as we go out, what parting words would you be willing to share with everyone? Oh, well, I would say for martial artists, just or for anyone, um, put one foot in front of the other. You know, the only the only way you fail is if you don't try. That's kind of the only thing I've learned in my life, you know, uh, I don't think you fail if you don't complete something, that's fine. But you have to try stuff. You have to try it. If you, if it's something that you believe in, you know, um, attempting something and maybe not completing it, that's not failure or doing well at it. That's not failure. Sitting on your ass and thinking, Oh, I should do that and never doing it. That's failure. You know, that's death to me. Now that you've listened, I'm going to guess that all of you out there know what I was talking about in the intro. Great conversation with an authentic, open person who just had such great stuff to share. And I hope that the fun that we both had came through for each of you. Thank you, Mr. Blair, for coming on the show. I Hope we can connect in person at some point. Maybe you'll even come play a show with the Toadies in Vermont. I'll be front row. If you want to check out everything we talked about today, we've got some photos, we got links, we got all kinds of great stuff over on the show notes page at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio.com. No hyphens, no punctuation, no spaces, no silly stuff in there. You can find all of our products on whistlekick.com. You can find some of them on Amazon. And you can get a hold of us. Social media, we are at Whistlekick. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And hopefully, you'll be back for the next episode. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate all of your support. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.